All right. Hello and welcome to Just Animals Podcast. I'm Al and with me as always is my dad, aka Guy. Well, I'm back from the dead after having that COVID shot uh, on our last podcast with the Dr. Lowe. I haven't Dr. seen that one yet. Oh, we haven't posted that yet? We haven't posted it yet, no. Okay. Well, there is the one that your know, next one coming up, Dr. Lowe. Mm-hmm. I was, I felt like Dr. Lowe should have shot me or harpooned me because I wanted to die after getting that COVID vaccine, the second dose. But uh, okay, anyway, great. I'm this back isn't Dr. Lowe's episode, but Thank anyways, you. moving on. All right. Sam, the zookeeper. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have two special guests with us today. Um, we've got Hannah and Ben with us. Hannah, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell our listeners where you're from and what you do. Sure. So really cool. I am the CEO of Action for Dolphins. We're a small marine mammal protection charity based out of Melbourne in Australia. Very cool. And then Ben. Hi there, I'm Ben. I'm the head of campaigns for World Animal Protection uh, in Australia and New Zealand. We're an international animal welfare organisation. We work on a lot of stuff, uh, but one of the things we work on is uh, dolphin captivity and trying to end it. Fantastic. That is so great. Thank you so much. And just a really quick shout out to Gordon Rossier from Michigan. Thank you so much. He commented on our blue-footed booby episode and I was like, oh, where are you from? And so, yes, thanks for listening, Gordon. We appreciate you. All right. So getting into it. First of all, how did you guys get into your respective fields really quick? Because it seems quite niche, uh, to so to speak. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I initially got into it after watching the documentary The Cove about dolphins. Ah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. That's, that was my catalyst too, uh, Hannah. Yeah, it re- it's, it's very haunting. And I, I actually watched it when I was in high school. And then I um, made my entire year group sit in the shape of a dolphin and hold up signs saying, save the dolphins and tried to raise money about it. So I've been passionate about it for a really long time. Beautiful. And That's awesome. yeah, then in university, I just I, re- I saw that Action for Dolphins was, was working on it. And I just reached out and asked for an internship and sort of worked my way up from there. And now you're CEO. Yeah, now you're CEO. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. That is so very cool. cool. That is so cool. All right, Ben, your turn. Did you raise a lot of money during your IPO, Hannah? And are you a Bitcoin billionaire now? (laughs) What? What? Hardly, no. (laughs) I asked if they raised a lot of money on their IPO. Okay. Great. All right. You don't steal Ben's son. Your turn, Ben. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually have a background in uh, climate and energy campaigning with organizations like Greenpeace, but I became increasingly interested in food and food systems and animal welfare uh, and then took this job uh, about four or five years ago. And when I started, I was really pleased to see that um, we were doing some work uh, on dolphins because family of mine, uh, as in my sister-in-law, she and her family used to go down to Coffs Harbour, uh, where Dolphin Marine Conservation Park is. And this is how we met Action for Dolphins, uh, starting to do some work against them. And it's this little venue and the, the people there, we get on with them very well. And I think that their hearts are in the right place, but it's a tiny little place with essentially backyard swimming pools and these dolphins, you know, living their, their lives mm. out there. And it's the kind of issue. And I think, you know, it, it really uh, reflects what Hannah has just said there. When you first get your head around how much dolphins suffer in captivity, you really can't do nothing about it. And so we right. really, really started to focus on it uh, much more than we had. Uh, and, you know, thankfully came into contact with Anna, uh, Action for Dolphins and uh, have been working with them ever since. That's but, ben, how did they acquire these uh, dolphins? It seems weird. Did they just go out and net them or how did they get them? So the main one was a dolphin called Bucky who died uh, recently. And uh, he actually um, was just washed up one day on an oyster bed. Uh, around Coffs Harbour. So in some cases, they they rescue the dolphins and then they uh, they say, well, we've got these dolphins and so we can't release them to the wild. But what they, they then did was they also bred them in captivity. And at SeaWorld up on the Gold Coast, which Hannah was talking about, most of the dolphins up there have been bred. So that is, it's not, you know, it's not rescue rehabilitation. It's not doing the right thing by dolphins right. that have, you know, been struck by a boat or something. It's actually breeding them for no other reason than to spend their life doing silly tricks and performing for humans. Yikes. So let me ask you a question, a follow-up question on that. If you had to grade the care of the animals, aside from the small enclosures, because these animals like to swim and they swim pretty fast, what would you, how would you classify their care of the animal? Do you want to jump in, Hannah? Yeah, I think there's only so much 
care you can give an animal when it is in such a confined space and a, a space that's so unnatural from their um from their usual habitat so they may be they may be being fed but they're being fed frozen fish and they're on um if they're not currently being bred they're on contraception and and that sort of life if you can imagine in a human perspective yeah if you were if you were locked up in a hotel room and given your meals every day and given exercise every day but you're not able to actually really live much of a life and and dolphins have I think one of the main things is they have really um strong social bonds when they're in captive environments those social dynamics are impacted massively and you know you have mothers who sometimes don't care for their babies properly and things like that so it's um that I think there's only a certain level of care you really can give in in such a restricted space okay wait time out you had you 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 stumped me on dolphin birth control that's (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah. So they're like putting, so, I mean, you know, for a human, that's a little bit different, but I can't imagine that's good for a dolphin to be on birth control. Like, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that seems just so unnecessary and unnatural. Is Am I wrong there in, in saying No, that? I completely agree. It's so unnatural, I think, because they're going to, like all animals, are going to try to procreate all the time. So they sort of have to do that. They have to monitor how they're going to, when they, they decide when dolphins can have a baby or not. So it's really taking away their sort of natural way of life. Um, right. Like, oh, oh, my God. So not, so not only did you take them from the ocean and put them in a fish tank, but now it's like, hey, we're going to mess with your body too even more. Yeah, I didn't even know that. Sam, did you know that they had dolphin birth control? I did. They they birth control everything. <laughs> they really? try to anyway. They try to. Um, sometimes uh, in the zoo field, um, they use birth control that's not – like they don't really have it for that animal, so it doesn't really work. Like, for example, capybaras. <laughs> we had a capybara that they um, tried to put birth control in, and it was like I, – I, I think it was – I don't even remember what the birth control – was for the animal that it was supposed to be for but it did not work whatsoever on cabbie bears but they just kept doing it and doing it just because i guess every time she got pregnant Mm -hmm. she would have a smaller litter than she would have i guess so they found out i don't know it yeah it's they do it with everything let's see that you just opened our eyes so aside from the obvious like you know you cannot recreate the ocean and natural habitat um why what is so what is wrong about like keep keeping you know cetaceans in captivity for some people you know because some people just genuinely don't know or don't you know they don't see a problem with it because you know we see if you're going to go to like a sea world or whatever and go see shamu or the dolphins or swim with the dolphins all you see is the front end and it's just like oh you know it looks like the dolphin's having fun doing this like he's smiling or you know we're giving him fish or whatever why is that so i don't want to say wrong but like why should we that should no longer be supported. Why is that so detrimental to these animals and to their just overall well being and health? I'm happy to jump in, Hannah, and grab that. I think the first thing, the smile is, uh, to be blunt, a bit of a problem uh, we all have because people look at the dolphins and think, yeah, as you said, they're smiling, they seem happy. Uh, they aren't. That's just the shape of their jaw. Um, <laughs> What what we'd really encourage people to think about, then, if you ever go to a captive dolphin venue or you see footage of dolphins at captive dolphin venues, in the wild, a dolphin probably swims about 100 square kilometres in a day, large distances. As Hannah said, they have these intricate social networks. They spend most of their time underwater, foraging, playing, hunting, engaging with the other members of the pod. You go to somewhere like SeaWorld. I remember the last time I was up there on the Gold Coast, and in fact, the SeaWorld in Orlando those dolphins spend a lot of their time just floating around near the surface of the water. And right. that's because they're bored and that's because they're traumatized, you know, because they are in this, as Hannah says, this life where it'd be like you in a hotel room and someone opens the door every now and then and throws a piece of frozen fish in and that's what you don't, and that's your life. So why is it cruel? Well, it's cruel because he's denying these dolphins the ability to exhibit natural behaviors. And what we're really starting to do more with animal welfare is acknowledge that it's not just about actively being cruel to an animal and stopping that cruelty. It's not about saying animal welfare is about stopping people beating their dogs. It's about recognizing that animals are sentient. All animals are sentient. 
and that they have certain natural behaviors that they want to explore, you know, and, and perform. A chicken likes to scratch around, it likes to perch, it likes to build nests. The same with a pig. A dolphin likes to explore the ocean, engage with other members of the pod. And when they're in these pools, they just can't do that. And that in itself, denying the ability to perform those behaviors is cruel, just as cruel as beating them with a stick or doing something else to cause them pain. Right. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Like if you take a highly social creature and then it's like they're in isolation or, I mean, even humans, like they say time, you know, we see time and time again, you know, they put humans in jail in like, you know, isolation and it's like they go nuts. And it's like, you can't, can't imagine for an animal who's like livelihood is based on social interaction. But thank you so much for uh, clarifying that and putting that out there. Cause yeah, it is, it's, you know, you see all the great family pictures. Like we, uh, sport uh you know now in hindsight 2020 we did it in hawaii we same with the dolphins and again you know the trainers seem like they care so much about the animals but their existence outside of that is not a, really in existence so that's yeah that's very important I too think when you go to a show and you see and there's the music and, and it is very circus like but you know some people see that side of it and they go oh this is great but then everybody walks away and leaves and then you see if you if you stick around you just notice that the dolphins literally usually just go off and find if there is any sort of shade which often there isn't at marine parks and they just literally f- float on the surface of the water sort of waiting for something right. else to maybe happen like it's really in between those ex- what seems like to be exciting moments of a show is just basically nothingness yeah yeah or they're just swimming circles around the tank and it's just like oh okay you're doing have, another circle i have a question and also tri- so um and this and this goes for i used i'm not in zookeeping anymore and i used to be but and i always said that um i wish i would be out of a job like even when i was zookeeping i was i wish this job doesn't exist i wish no animals to be under human care, I wish we could see them all in the wild. That's where they belong, and that's what people say when they um, when they say, "Well, we shouldn't be keeping these animals because they belong in the wild." But um, there is no wild left, and it's fat. It's it's dwindling quickly. And what do you guys do to you guys do things like conservation things out in their natural habitats? Like what what kind of stuff do you do to to make their wild a better place because we're ruining it so we can get you know so those people can't say well well we need to keep them in captivity because you know they're going to be extinct soon like what kind of things do you guys do as an organization both you i guess to to, you know i think that's a really good point and i think in the in the um example of dolphins and bottlenose dolphins for example they're not actually endangered in the wild so somewhere like in Australia where the two marine parks are in Coffs Harbour and on the Gold Coast that that they they do have bottlenose populations of dolphins out in the wild so you are able to just go out on a boat and see them in their natural habitats but in a more general sense I think both World Animal Protection and Action for Dolphins we also work to protect them in in their natural habitats and and Action for Dolphins, our main campaigns are to try to stop the dolphin hunting over in Japan, which threatens their, the, the population species survival in, in general, and also That's to remove lethal one. shark nets, which they have up in Queen, New South Wales and Queensland here in Australia, which capture dolphins and turtles and um, manta rays and a whole bunch of other animals other than sharks and, and are ineffective in protecting swimmers so those are sort of our other areas that we work on and also a bit on illegal hand feeding of dolphins in the wild which which threatens their survival also okay yeah that's that's a hard thing to do tell people to stop doing that yeah just we talk about that all the time it's, on yeah, our show it's like humans. observe with your eyes pet the animal with your let eyes let me ask you about <laughs> um your effectiveness in japan do they really care what australians have to say uh, or is it just like wow, you, okay. you don't understand us because we're Japanese? What what's what's the attitude? So action for dolphins, our tactic in Japan is actually through legal action, and we work with Japanese organizations and Japanese lawyers to to bring those actions. So our most successful campaign was when we 
brought an inter, uh, a legal action against an international organisation, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And off the back of that, they suspended their Japanese, the Japanese association because some of their aquariums had ties with Taiji dolphins. They were um, importing their dolphins to be in captivity from the hunts. And by that suspension, in order for the Japanese association to get back in, they cut all ties with Taiji. So 62 aquariums stopped buying their dolphins and it cut some of the um, demand from the hunts. So... That's an example of it really does work. And, yeah, we also work with Japanese groups. It's not so much just like us coming in and saying you should be doing this. What uh, what impact impact have you seen? Have you seen any positive impact uh, from your efforts? Yeah, we have. We have seen positive impact impacts like in that in that example and also a lot of people within Japan don't actually know about the dolphin hunting so much because for example the cove was really heavily censored over there so some of the other things we do is we've put up billboards before in Osaka and busy cities around Japan and we worked with an organization who's local in those areas who stood underneath and explained to people what it was and Raising awareness in that sense is also really important. Are they still um, eating a lot of dolphin? Because I remember from the cove, they showed the level of mercury was astronomical. Uh, and um, I just wonder where, where that is right now. Have, have they gotten a message on dolphin consumption in terms of its health impact? It is still being consumed, but that's actually Action for Dolphins next tactic is to focus back on the mercury issue. And we're we're currently testing um, the mercury levels, which are at least 25 times higher than than what's legal. And we're looking at submitting a criminal complaint in Japan about that as well. So it continues, unfortunately, despite the public health. Risk. So, so there uh, here in the U.S. we have this thing called the uh, USDA, United States Agricultural, what is it, U.S. Department of Agriculture. So, there's nobody that monitors these the fish that's sold in the supermarkets or anything like that. There's nobody concerned about freshness and quality and wholesomeness and. It's just there is so catch the, it and sell it. Yeah, there is the the Japanese health minister. And that's who, who we're currently targeting and trying to get this on the agenda with. But they, they do have those regulations in place. It's, it's just a matter of enforcing them. Right. Do you, do you think that they feel like uh, you're an outsider and you don't understand their culture? Is that, do you, do you ever sense that at all? The people that we've been working with have a, agree with us. So if we're, if we're, talking about working with the lawyers or working with um, our plaintiffs for some of our legal actions, they're on they're on the same side as us. They want the same thing. So it's not so much us versus them. It's more so, you know, working, yeah, together. working together. Perfect. So I have a question. So um, for you, Ben, thank you so much, Hannah. For you, Ben, I was looking up, um, well, I was reading one of those articles that the other Hannah sent me about Zippy, Bell and Jet. Can you explain these sea sanctuaries, like um, where they want to move them to? Like, how does that work? And what's that process? And how's that going? Sure. Well, firstly, I want to call out the fact that the idea of a sea sanctuary and the early work on that was actually done by Action for Dolphins. Um, oh, shout out to Hannah. <clears throat> and they were, yeah, absolutely. And her excellent colleague, Jordan, uh, who's currently Yay, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> off on maternity leave. But um, when we met up with Action for Dolphins early up, uh, their idea was, look, why don't we try to actually uh, establish a sea sanctuary in the harbour of Coffs Harbour? Uh, There's an area there which is already relatively protected. And their thought was, look, given that we know the venue isn't really viable in its current state, let's move the then five dolphins uh, to a sea sanctuary. And they uh, got some early traction with the uh, venue owners uh, by taking legal action against them. Uh, And Hannah, jump in and and feel feel free to edit the story I'm telling about your great work. (laughs) But um, (laughs) um, uh, and the owners, uh, a new guy named Terry took over and he said, look, I'm, I'm happy to do that. The fact is that uh, you know, the, the park in its current form isn't financially viable. Uh, so we're happy to have a look at this feasibility study. So World Animal Protection agreed to chip in $100,000 uh, and 
uh, we funded the work that Action for Dolphins had already started progressing, which was we got an institute down here to do some sort of, you know, um, some technical work around what would a sea sanctuary in the harbour look like? You know, what would you have to do in terms of building breakwaters, netting? Right. Uh, they did a lot of work around the kind of wave action and whether or not it was actually viable. Uh, we then got uh, a, a dolphin welfare expert named, uh, oh, and her name is complete, Isabella Clegg, thank you, uh, to come down here and do an assessment and just ask the question, look, would the dolphins be better off in the harbour? And she said yes. And I mean, I think that was always pretty obvious anyway. They would have right. much more room to move. Yeah. It would be a much more natural environment. So where we are now is that uh, it's pretty clear that um, based on what we've done so far, it would be feasible to move the dolphins uh, down to this sanctuary. Uh, we need to do a bit more work, and what we're hoping now is that the New South Wales government, this the state in which this Coffs Harbour venue is, uh, will mm -hmm. actually pick it up. And what happened last year, which was fantastic, uh, was that um, we had this inquiry into cetacean captivity in New South Wales, uh, and this year, sorry, um, the inquiry's recommendations came out, and they included that the New South Wales government should support our efforts in continuing the feasibility study. Now, what's great about this is, you know, we're not just talking about three dollars dolphins. We're, and right. to be clear, that in itself would be justifiable enough. The youngest of those dolphins right. is 10, so it would live for another 40 years. Uh, but also, um, it could be used as a rescue and rehabilitation facility. So sure, dolphins sure. that... Uh, two for one. That's exactly right. So you'd be moving dolphins through. And we estimate at least one to two dolphins a year uh, would benefit from that if it was established. But then more broadly, it shows captive uh, dolphin venues, captive sedation venues generally, this is a viable way forward. I mean, we know that the tide is turning against dolphin captivity. We know that the social acceptability of going and seeing these shows is declining. And what this will do is show these owners that if you stop breeding and you start to look at a sea sanctuary concept for your dolphins, uh, that's a way of ensuring that those dolphins that can't be released uh, can still have the best life possible. Gotcha. So for as far as the sea sanctuary goes, and I know you mentioned breakwater, so would those dolphins be able to kind of come and go as they please or would they be permanently there or how does that no, they'd work. stay there. They'd be in a net. The thing about these dolphins is those three dolphins are actually um, the offspring of Bucky, the dolphin I talked about okay. before, the old one who died. Sure. Now, the thing sure. is, they just wouldn't know what to do in the ocean. Right. That's okay, the sad right. thing. That they um, would go out and die. Yeah, well, they'd, they'd be really released would. in the wild and then it'd be like, okay, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. So I mean, for my food. Would, would they stay in the <laughs> harbor and just be cared for? Or what, what, what's the vision? I'm not sure. They would it. still have to be cared for. So um, there's a bit of discussion about that, actually. Um, we, um, at the moment we're sort of hoping what would happen is they'd be in the harbour, they'd still be fed, uh, fish. Um, but, uh, I was chatting to a, a vet the other day who said, look, you never know, they might actually sort of rediscover that natural instinct to, uh, feed, you know, and catch fish. Who knows? Right. That might happen. Uh, we even talked with the, um, vet at Dolphin Marine Conservation Park about the, um, possibility of, you know, maybe even sort of letting them out a little bit and seeing what happens. I, I think that's probably unlikely, but, you know, all of those experiments <laughs> yeah. could be done. All of those experiments could be done. But yeah, the main problem is just if you let those dolphins out, uh, it would take, I mean, like half a day before they got eaten by a shark, hit by a boat, you know, it <laughs> right. would be terrible. So oh, that would be the worst thing to do. <laughs> yeah, they true. don't have any street smarts, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It does make sense. Yeah, because where I live, uh, they, we have a breakwater and it's a big controversial thing, you know, for surf and whatnot. And I always get nervous because every now and then actually last spring i saw there was a mama whale and like a baby whale in there and i was like no you're gonna get stuck because the tide can go out really low and then like so is that a worry too is like with tidal patterns and whatnot because i'm sometimes the beach where i live by aches out super far and i was like no these wheels if they get stuck in here because there's a bunch of boat traffic in there too it's by a big port and it's like, oh, I don't want to hear about these poor whales on the news, you know, the ne a couple hours later and how they accidentally beached themselves or, sure. you know, they're stuck in the harbor. And now, you know, they have to call in marine biologists to try to get them out or even up north where we used to live. Every now and then a humpback whale gets stuck in the inside the bay, inside the bay. It goes too far beyond the Golden Gate Bridge and it's stuck in the San Francisco Bay. And it's like, OK, we need to help this whale get out because it's all yeah. disoriented and whatnot. <laughs> Well, that was part of the feasibility study, essentially, that okay. um, this uh, organization called Manly Hydraulics Laboratory did. They looked at all the wave and tidal action at this area. And it's never, you know, it's it's not going to ever be a situation where there's not enough water for the dolphins. And in fact, there's going to be so much more water than they've ever experienced. Um, right. you know, the, the only thing that uh, we had to think about also is that the poor thing is when we put them in there for the first time, they'll probably be quite terrified just by the size right. 
by you know right. things like live fish, other animals, um, right. the movement like of crabs. the water, which obviously just doesn't happen as much in their current environment. Right, right. Oh, that's in, see, that's something I would have never even thought about. It's like, yeah, that's still going to be – granted, it's much better for them. That's still pretty jarring, though, to go from essentially your fish tank to then this open lake, basically. Yeah. That's right. Wow. They've never known anything else. And they'll get so, used right. to it and they'll enjoy yeah. it. Right. And they'll love it yeah. because they're right. intelligent animals. But, yeah. yeah. Right. They'll realize, yeah, it'll eventually they'll put the pieces together. Like, actually, no, this is much better than the fish tank. I like this a lot more. <laughs> so, can you tell us about um, the uh, mentality or attitude of Australians for your cause? How how, how do you think it's being received? Or yeah, how receptive are they to? Uh, our, does it depend on your- demographic of age? Uh, does it depend on where they live? Um, I'd like to know, like, is the tide turning with respect to uh, keeping these animals in captivity? Yeah, the tide is definitely turning away. So I believe World Animal Protection Hub before and, and Action for Dolphins have um, commissioned polls before and, and one we did a couple of years ago found that two out of three Australians aren't interested in seeing dolphins in captivity and actually oppose it. And I think one of the the strongest examples of that would be the legislative change in New South Wales and also the fact that that marine park, Dolphin, Dol- Dolphin Marine Conservation Park, is considering the sanctuary option and has stopped breeding. Now there's only one park left in Australia, SeaWorld up on the Gold Coast, who have an active breeding program. And it's very unlikely any other marine park will open up because it, it ultimately is a dying industry. And people aren't now that there's so much more information about how cruel it is, people don't really find it entertaining to see dolphins sort of acting like circus animals and jumping around pools. It's um, it's a very outdated sort of source of entertainment and, and people can, as I said, just go out and see these dolphins in their natural habitats. There's um, swim with dolphin programs out in the wild all over Australia. So Times are definitely changing and I think that it's great the law is catching up with that in New South Wales and we're aiming for it to be the same in Queensland. Cool, that's great. So, so do you think uh, that these animals are smart enough to know that, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to my feeding place, which is not a captive place, and, you know, I know I get a treat there or I know I can always find food there or I can find some interaction there. Do you think that would ever be possible so that, you know, you could say, hey, we the dolphins come in or you can expect to see a dolphin here. So in other words, it's not a captive show, but it could be like the sanctuary where, hey, the dolphins hang out. Or like, for instance, when you go whale watching, depending on the season, you go out on the boat in the ocean and, you know, they know where the whales are in, in Hawaii. And they're not interfering with the whales. They're not getting too close to the whales. But yet you can see the whales jumping out of the water and flapping their tails and appreciate the animal, but not necessarily have to have the animal as a captive. Is there such a thing that could be done like that with, yeah. with dolphins? Yeah, absolutely. And there, there already is. I've been on many, many dolphin watching tours. Even when you go out on whale watching tours here, you'll often have, you'll often see dolphins and they like to play, they like to swim with the bow of the boat. So you can see them like having a great time all on their terms. They come up to the boat, they interact, and then when they're over it, they swim on. And so you have, and it, and it's completely, um, it's, it makes you feel so happy to, to interact with these animals on those nat- natural terms, on their terms. I think um, you mentioned feed. The issue with feeding them when they're in the wild, though, is that they um, there's been a lot of studies that show that wild-fed dolphins start to ignore their calves, and there's a higher calf mortality for wild-fed dolphins because they go, "Oh, I can just go and get food over here at this time of day. I'm going to do that," and they do tend to ignore their their young or don't teach their young essential hunting skills. Um, so definitely not for feeding them, but you can absolutely just go out and see and interact with them in the wild already all across Australia. If I must say there is 
being fortunate enough to see, well, I'm not fortunate to see captive, but there's something different about seeing animal like dolphins and whales in their natural environment. It's just, it's way more, I don't want to say magical because it sounds super cliche, but it is. It's just, it is almost magical seeing them and their natural habitat exhibiting natural behaviors. And it's like, that's where you belong. And um, when I was talking with the other Hannah, speaking of whale watching tours, uh, she briefly opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, there are things to look out for when, you know, you want to go sign up for those. So what do you guys recommend? What are like the red flags um, for whale watching or dolphin watching tours? What do you, what, how do you know if it's an ethical one versus one that's just trying to make a quick buck and maybe is disturbing the animals? Um, yeah. Actually, um, sorry, Ben, I'll just jump in on this one because Action for Dolphins um, has actually written an ethical guide to seeing dolphins out in the oh, wild. Fantastic. Yeah, so that that's just up on our website, afd.com. but I think some of the main red flags would be getting the boat sort of chasing them or trying to get up too close to them what what you're supposed to do regulated here in Australia is once you see dolphins or whales you stop the boat and then you wait for them to come up to you so that you're not enforcing the interaction and I think one of the other big red flags would probably be feeding also because that's that's not a completely natural sort of interaction um right but yeah we do have a a pretty thorough guide into what to look out for and one of the red flags I think probably oh fantastic also if they say you will definitely 100% you know guarantee see dolphins or swim with dolphins that that can sometimes be a red flag too because you wonder how are you guaranteeing sort of a A wild animal yeah just coming up to this boat at this time of yeah this yeah this wild animal is going to be here right at 12 15 yeah mm, that's always a little bit (laughs) a little bit sus Right. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And then that makes a lot of sense too. Like you don't want to be chasing them down. Like, and yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. That's, that's, is great. And then, um, Ben, do you want to tell us about the new whale heritage sites? Sure. <clears throat> and they're great. Um, so we are honored to say that the first one is actually in Australia, Harvey Bay Yay! in Queensland. And that's great. And I mean, it's really important that it's in Harvey Bay because also it's like, look, if you've got a, the choice between going to SeaWorld uh, and seeing, you know, seeing dolphins there in captivity, uh, and then you've got the choice between then going to Harvey Bay instead and seeing them, you know, in the natural environment, why on earth would you choose SeaWorld? I mean, really? Yeah, so no. that's just crazy. So we're really encouraging people come on see them in their natural habitat and so the whale heritage sites are a way of doing that and it's not just that um they're sites which you know abide by some of the things that hannah was talking about there in terms of their interaction with the um uh with the animals but it's also that they do things like they have an education focus they have a conservation focus uh and so they're really positive now i should call out the fact that you in the usa also have a whale heritage site that's a yeah da- it's not far from us is it dana point dana i was going to say is dana yeah. or dana in california <laughs> yeah uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like maybe an hour and a half from me, yeah, Dana great. Point. It's beautiful too. And that's one of the recent ones. And then there's one in Tenerife, a bit further away, and the Bluff in South Africa. And more and more are coming through uh, the accreditation process. And again, it's it's just a really a good way of showing of saying to people, look, there are places you can go where you can see whales, you can see dolphins, you can see marine mammals in their natural habitat uh, in ways which is you know not just not captive, but is also sustainable with a great focus on education and respect. And and so we're hoping that as more and more of those come on board, that'll put even more pressure on the captive industry by providing such a great alternative. Right. That's fantastic. And yeah, it looks like the one just opened up in Spain. Yep. Is that, in Tenerife. Is that that's right. Oh, that's the one. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. That's so great. Oh, that's so cool. So I know you guys are like talking about whales and, and, um, and dolphin. How, how's the shark population doing around Australia? Are you aware of anything going on with the, their viability or? How they how they how are they faring? Or you I'm don't care to... about sharks? <laughs> no, we do. We we care a lot about sharks, and in fact, sharks sharks are one of those difficult species where, you know, most people's response to sharks is, "Oh God, we need to, uh, you know, we need to kill them." Quite Get frankly, them. and right. you know, AFD is doing fantastic work at the moment on these shark nets, which not only kill sharks that are unnecessary, uh, but also kill a whole bunch of other animals. Um, Sharks, unfortunately, are under a lot of pressure. Millions are killed every year. Uh, In Australia, some species are becoming uh, threatened as a result. Um, There are practices such as uh, the uh, creation of shark fin soup, which are putting real pressure on the populations as well. But um, 
you know, sharks have every right to exist as the rest of us do. Uh, I think sometimes there's this kind of crazy human assumption that, uh, oh, well, if I go into the shark's habitat uh, and the shark's response is to attack me, then my response is to kill them. Well, the other option, of course, is to stay out of the habitat. Um, the other thing that's happening, which is encouraging, is there are some non-lethal methods of uh, repelling sharks that are also now being developed. There's sort of things like something you can put around your ankle, which sort of sends a signal which drives the shark away. But generally, I think the pressure on sharks and the slaughter of sharks globally is, is one of those things which probably deserves more attention than it gets and certainly something we're very concerned about. Well, you need to listen to our uh, shark expert episode, uh, Dr. Lowe, who's part of the shark lab in uh, yeah, he runs uh, the shark lab. Cal State Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach, right? And uh, he's an expert in sharks. Uh, he was um, inspired by Jaws. He comes from Martha's Vineyard, I think, right? Or somewhere over there in Massachusetts. Right. And uh, he said, he told us that shark populations cannot re rebloom as quickly as fish populations. It takes a long time. So when you mess with the ecology, uh, it's going to, there's unintended consequences and you're not going to be able to recover quickly when you have sharks uh, being decimated like that. So anyway, word to you guys, I'm sure you know that already. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they're so important because they're apex predators in the ocean as well. So right. the whole right. chain, the whole ecosystem falls apart without them at the top. So yeah. it's definitely, and as Ben said, they, they get a really bad rap and especially here in Australia with um, the so, possible threat of a shark encounter, yeah. The, yeah, the media reports on it, the same shark encounter up to 30 times. Well, so it's... Don't, oh my don't, God. don't go there. You know, they, they have the right to be there and you have the right to be where you are and just don't go in their neighborhood. But um, yeah. one of the questions I wanted to ask you is that I think from a different show, Auntie Roo, Roo told us, Roo. I don't know if you know Auntie Roe. Um, she's a kangaroo enthusiast. She's a, a, um, she's a First Nation elder. Yeah. I'll give her her full respect. Okay, sorry. I forgot her title. First Nation. Yeah. Um, indigenous, we call that here. Um, you have people in your government that are sort of animal party type people. I, I, we don't have an animal friendly party. We have non-animal friendly humans, but, uh, are you working alongside of them and how, how are they helping you, uh, legally? Uh, I'll jump in, Hannah, and maybe add, if I missed, Paul, the Animal Justice Party is a pretty new party in Australia, and they've been pretty successful. So they've got two MPs in the New South Wales Parliament, and they've got one in the Victorian Parliament, and they're pretty active okay. uh, around the place. Now, how have they helped us? Well, on the issue of dolphins, uh, Emma Hurst, who is um, one of the New South Wales MPs, was responsible for setting up the uh, inquiry into captive cetaceans and the use of exotic animals in circuses that led to, first, the breeding ban, for dolphins in New South Wales, which is really globally significant because that is a legislated ban on the breeding of, of captive cetaceans. So that's absolutely fantastic. And also that recommendation about supporting the feasibility study. So they are three super active MPs who are just driving the uh, animal welfare, animal rights agenda really hard and getting a lot done. Kangaroos is one of the ones that uh, Mark Pearson is particularly uh, interested in as an issue. Yes. It's, a, it's a, a funny thing in Australia. I mean, we, we shoot our national emblem. Um, you know, it's a, right. it's a crazy just, thing. Right. We talked about that with Auntie Rose. Basically, like mm. if Americans would just go out and shoot bald eagles and it's like, what? You would not go do that. <laughs> it's very cruel. Well, it's a really- Benjamin Franklin wanted the turkey as our national bird, but- Okay, we, great. Anyways, <laughs> moving on back to what Ben was saying. <laughs> No, it sounds like you've already covered this in a previous podcast, but yeah, it's just we a did. repeat. It's just extraordinary. Yeah, but go ahead. Cruel. Please do. It it's, is. It is. It's it's horrific, and it's just like you know, it's it's weird to call something a pest that's been there for millions of years. It's like I'm not quite sure how you can call an animal that's survived before you, and well, assuming we don't kill all of them, will still be here after you as a pest. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I mean, you know, we all we, we talk about people who eat meat. Uh, one of the things that's absolutely essential, and this is generally agreed, of course is what you would say is humane slaughter, you know, that the, when the animal comes to the end of its life. There's no way that's happening with kangaroos. You have people no. out there in the dark shooting them. And the industry says, well, you know, we we do clean headshots and we always, we never miss. And that's, of course, complete nonsense, as we know, it's because bull. the sheer number of kangaroos <laughs> that are they're, killed, they're not, even they're, if you... They're not that good of a shot, let me just no. tell you that, especially uh, on uh, a moving uh, target. 
and given that you've got millions of animals being killed every year, millions of kangaroos, even if you're sort of your miss rate to call it that is 1%, you're still talking about a lot of animals who therefore get shot with a high caliber bullet run off and probably spend the next week or so dying in absolute agony. And in many cases, uh, they have joeys in the pouch. Now, the industry says, well, we only shoot males. But again, I mean, if you're out there in the dark, that's not always quite obvious. How do you know? Quite How obvious, do you know? Do you, which you, is, you which. Can see their penis? How do you know there? It's a male. It's yeah. like a- and then beyond that, just uh, to be completely clear, you know, the hygiene issues around that industry are extraordinary. I mean, the, the oh, shooter yeah. will go so out that there, was, that first was kangaroo a big gets- issue. Yeah, yeah, gets thrown so, on a meat hook and just goes driving around on the back of a truck for eight hours. Right, with yeah, dust so they, and They're not refrigerated particles. for hours and, mm. and then it gets to, uh, we. you call it an abattoir. I just had to look that word up again because I forgot. We chiller call it a box. slaughterhouse. Uh, yeah, so no, they're they not the being refrigerated while they're being hauled around. And it just seems, that seems despicable. And I don't know how they can sell that meat. It It has to be tainted. I don't know. It's weird. And a lot of it's pet food, and then a lot of it gets made into boots. So pretty pleased to see a couple of um, American lawmakers uh, passing or at least introducing a bill which would ban the importation of kangaroo skins to the US. Hats off to them uh, for that piece of work. And it's also good to see private companies uh, starting to move away from the use of kangaroo leather as well. So there's some positive, uh, positive signs there. Right, right. That's fantastic. So I was um, also seeing... So these plastic fishing nets, they're obviously detrimental to every type of marine creature. Are they trying to ban them completely across Australia or is there like, you know, maybe a more eco-friendly net that you guys are working on or anything you can talk about with that? Banning plastic fishing nets would be pretty hard. I mean, that's, you know, synthetic nets are pretty much what the industry uses, but there are a range of things you can do to ensure that they don't get lost because that's really the issue. Okay. It's, uh, we okay. call them ghost nets. When the issue, when the when the nets are lost, abandoned, or just discarded into the sea, uh, you know they essentially spend the next couple of hundred years floating around doing exactly what they were designed to do, which is catching things. Right. Uh, right. And in Australia, we have a hotspot for what we call ghost nets, which is the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's the big body of water right up at the top, of the north of Australia. Uh, the nets come in there mainly from illegal fishing operations uh, in the Timor and Arafura Seas, which are up around Indonesia, PNG. Uh, they get into the Gulf and they just go floating around. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of uh, vulnerable turtle populations are. And thousands of turtles are captured by those nets there. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a terrible death. Uh, they can be suffocated uh, in the ground. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, they get, you know, just in some cases entangled and then can't hunt. Uh, it's, it's pretty poor what happens. So the Australian fishing industry has generally been good at uh, getting better at just not losing its nets in the first place. But if it does lose them, actually going back and retrieving them. And a lot of the th- sort of things that we have been advocating uh, for through the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which we set up, is the things like year marking and tagging and the like. So you actually have a transponder right. or something. So if you lose that net, you've got to go back and get it. Or if someone finds it, they can find who the right. owner was and come after them. Uh, right, that's what I was just about to say. I was yeah. to say, I hope there's some sort of tracking. So it's like, hey, you know, boat 2A, we have your net. Not only are you being fined, but come yeah. pick up your net. Come and get your net. <laughs> Problem, of course, is a lot of the ghost gear in the world's wo- uh, oceans is actually illegal fishing. So uh, <sighs> you have uh, a lot of illegal fishers out there. And what happens when they get caught? They throw their nets overboard. So that's, Fanta- that's great. So that's I one of the things we need to track down as well. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I have another question for you about, do you guys have a, uh, Sea turtles, marine turtles around Australia? Yep. How, is the, how are they doing? Are they protected? Uh, well, they are in a variety of um, – uh, in some cases they're endangered, in other cases they're vulnerable. So they need they need protection and they're still uh, under threat from a variety of things, um, be it feral pigs digging up their nests, uh, be it ghost <gasps> gear in the waters. Wow. Yeah, we have a very big feral pest pop- uh, problem in Australia. So- so do we? It's, say, it's so do we, They're everywhere. They, yeah, Texas. So do, it's yeah, so m- bad mo- in the most US. States, Yeah, Texas is just being decimated by feral pigs. Um, but you know, maybe if you turn those kangaroo hunters on the feral pigs, that could right. solve Why two problems. Right? Why don't you ever shoot something that should actually be and, shot? Because and then they, they can't can make eat money. The pork and donate the skins, and they they should put a bounty. I mean, on the on the feral pigs. Let them turn all them kangaroo guys out on the pigs. 
I mean, I feel obliged to say that we would always advocate, even for a feral animal, that in the event that there's no other option other than uh, culling, that that be done uh, in a very humane way. Uh, certainly in the past, uh, we've seen culling operations which have involved people in helicopters, and you then get the same cruelty associated with the kangaroo industry where animals are wounded and left to die. There's, there's other right, ways yeah, we also. Can't, yeah, we don't want to do that. Yeah, no, no, we and, don't want to just... That's right. And we need to we need to exhaust non-lethal methods. I mean, you can do immunocastration, which is effective uh, in the same way. So we, we think other options like that need to be introduced uh, before we go down the route of culling. Right. Yeah. Well, so unfortunately, here in the States, it's just it, we're past doing that. Uh, it's just it's I don't know what he's doing back there. It's that's just how out of control like they're attacking kids. They're they're decimating farmland like billions of dollars in agriculture are lost each year because of them. And like, again, they're, they're, they're showing up in playgrounds and like attacking children and horrifically hurting them. So, you know, there's also that fear around them, too. But yeah, when, you know, you see like people go out and they'll set up those pins where they can trap them and then, you know, take them into like a slaughterhouse or whatever so that they're not just being like shot and run around or whatever. But, you know, that only catches like four or six pigs at the most. That doesn't catch, that doesn't help with the hundreds of thousands of them that are running around. Unrelated note. So I don't know if there's, I'm sure there is like an Australian equivalent of your Navy, like we have here in the U S and we use Marine mammals as a part in our Navy. 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 This is the Australian Navy. Is that correct? There is one. Yeah. Okay. And d- does your Navy use marine animals like we do here in the U.S.? Like we use sea lions, beluga whales, dolphins. Um, is that prevalent for don't you guys? I think so. Hannah, do you know of that? I don't think they do. I don't, yeah, I don't think so either. Really? Okay. Yeah. Welcome to well, America. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, welcome to you. No kidding. <laughs> that's really good to hear that you guys, yeah. you guys are at least doing that because, yeah, we've um, – uh, we've had quite a few animals and I know they still do, but it's just kind of like that goes back into the captive thing where, you know, you're feeling weird. It's like so because like when they got beluga whales, they would have these, you know, Inuit members help them go catch it. And then, you know, so they they're trying to spin it. So it's like, well, we only caught the initial wild pair and now we breed them in captivity. And it's like, OK, so you're not necessarily taking them from the wild, but that's still not a natural existence for them. So it's still ethically speaking, it still doesn't make it any better like yeah you still had to get the initial pair from the wild and then transport it from alaska down to california and again now they're just stuck in their fish tank and then you're they're doing the captive breeding so it's like how would you suggest combating that or you know being like hey this is still wrong even though granted you're not taking them from the wild but you're still doing captive breeding of cetaceans what do you think the best like way to get the ball rolling on that and being like hey let's rethink this um i think the animal welfare angle is an important one and people realizing more and more just how sentient dolphins are and what sort of being able to imagine a bit more just how horrible that that life is for them and confinement also i think debunking the idea that breeding them breeding a dolphin in captivity is related to conservation because as, as we've learned with the sanctuary, if you breed a dolphin in a captive environment, you can't release it back into the wild. It doesn't have any of those essential skills. So there isn't right. a conservation argument, especially in a, in an enter- in a marine park entertainment park um, context for breeding those dolphins. Really, you should be having sanctuaries set up where you can rehabilitate and, and put them back into the wild. So there's just pretty much no argument from, for it in from our perspective. And that's a great point too, because, you know, like Sam's worked with captive breeding, but then like with the wolves, but then they put them back out into, you know, into the wild, but that works for certain animals. But that's something I didn't even know, like for dolphins, and you thank you for pointing that out, like for dolphins, once they're bred in captivity, like that's it. They're not going to, they can't go back out into the wild, which is so it's basically – you're basically like ruining in the animal's chance of any sort of natural life once it's done, which is yeah. Wow, and as I said, there's very, also right. not um, sort of debunking the conservation myth even further. There's right, not, that's not conserving they, anything if they're not going back out, and, and, they're, not in, <laughs> and they're not endangered either. The Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins, so you don't need to breed them in captive environments. You just work on the other other side of protecting their habitats and and keeping them from being threatened or endangered. So it's a pretty, I think, I think people unfortunately buy into it. They think, oh, this is doing, 
this is doing good for the species. We're helping. Yeah, they're right. ambassadors for the species, but the reality is it's just not the case at all. Okay. No, that's that's really good to know. So to sum up, there's captive breeding is not conserving any sort of cetacean population whatsoever. If anything, it's making it it's worsening their population. That okay. Wow. Just That's one last thing on that. Thing. I mean, the other thing is, sure, that, yeah. you know, certainly in a lot of cases in Australia, and I think it's the same over there, you're talking about Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins, and they're just not endangered. There's plenty of them in right, the Right, so there's no need for it either. No. Right. That's right. Yeah. They're, yeah. That they're makes sense. And what's great too about... Wild. Just let them go. Right. Leave them alone. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of our thing too. It's just but, let them be. Save the wild too. Keep their right. wild, wild. Like, right. Stop throwing stuff in the ocean. Exactly. Yeah. I hate people. It's, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. So That's is that, is, angry. is it bad uh, like it is here? Um, like with just trash draining into the ocean in Australia? Is that a, a problem for you guys as well? Yes. Pollu- yeah. Pollution is definitely a, a big issue here as well. Um, Action for Dolphins, we run sort of semi regular beach cleans and, it's surprising <clears throat> you'll walk down to the beach and you think oh yeah it looks pretty clean and then you actually start sweeping and you'll pick up thousands of cigarette butts and little microplastics and little styrofoam balls and it's um yeah it's definitely a, a worldwide issue the plastic pollution and pollution in general really especially in the ocean that's actually a great point so how we can help at the ocean just in general and every marine animal beach cleanups and, you know, making sure trash is disposed of responsibly and not letting it just blow out of the trash can or, you know, actually throwing. More importantly, just use your metal container instead of using plastic bottles for water. That will cut down tremendously amount amount of plastic that's being used and having to be recycled and people don't put them, dispose of them properly. So just carry a canteen, a metal reusable canteen. It's much better for the environment. Yeah. So how can our listeners help for both of your um, organizations? What can our listeners do aside from obviously being more responsible, educating others, what to have a direct impact? What can, what can we do on our end? No, I think one of the main things would probably be pledging not to go and see dolphins in captivities and, and making a stance on that. Um, definitely getting involved with uh, animal protection charities, whether locally or, or globally, with World Animal Protection and Action for Dolphins. Um, feet cleanups are always good. Ben jumping. Mm-hmm. Look, I think that's right. What, what Hannah said first is is really important, and I think sometimes people underestimate how powerful it is to be prepared to stand up uh, in a group of your friends or family and say, "No, I don't go to Sea World because it's cruel." And I'm just not going to go and spend money and take my children there. I think that's really important. You know, we know that in a lot of cases, you know, that sense of social acceptability is really influenced by people's peers. So it's fine for Hannah and I to tell a bunch of people who've never met and never will met that they shouldn't do something. But, you know, if you've got that that aunt or that uncle or that family member who says, come on, guys, we all know it's it's cruel. It's almost like you're calling it out. And that can be really, right. really powerful. So that kind of thing is helpful. And then, yeah, the practical stuff as well, the beach cleans, getting involved, donating to organizations like ours really works. You know, we, we as in ourselves in Action for Dolphins, over the last four years have been very successful. And uh, if you are prepared to donate money to us, we can promise you we will spend it well on behalf of animals. Perfect. Yeah, well, I uh, wanted to point out that the, just I just wanted to say real quick, and I'm I, I don't know if you guys already talked about this because I had to let my dog out, but um, the World Animal Protection Australia, the, the organization that Ben's, Ben works for, is freaking amazing. They right. are protecting like all the way down to farm animals, all the way up to bears and elephants, all kinds of things. They're just, it's wonderful. I, I love the farm animal aspect because I think a lot of people do not. Do not think about oh, farm animals farm are animals so abused are, are, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for so that. So I'm just, I, I love it. It's really great. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I used to enjoy going to SeaWorld, and I used to enjoy going to the circus. And uh, after seeing the cove, I will not do it. Absolutely not. Not in no, Blackfish. No. The cove the, and Blackfish. The, yeah. Um, I think dolphins may be smarter than we are. I I, I don't know. I know. They I probably are. That. They probably are smarter than we are, uh, because I don't think they kill each other like we do. But okay, I don't know. Um, 
and uh, they're wonderful mammals and um, they don't deserve to be in prison. That's not what their life is about. So I'm, I'm with you then. And the Cove did it for me. So hopefully Japan, uh, they can put Cove on YouTube and all those Japanese anime people and uh, can, can start watching it. Maybe, yeah, so did uh, Blackfish maybe help- BTS has to get on board, get BTS on board. Okay. So did Blackfish help your cause? Is that, do you guys reference that movie or whatever? Um, Cause I, I mean, it's, 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 very eye-opening and it's like oh well i if i was kept in a fish tank and i'm an orca i probably would lose my mind too and maybe act out every now and then you know yeah definitely blackfish had a huge influence and i and i think it's a really amazing documentary because it also shows the threat to humans of of keeping these, these animals in unnatural conditions so that they basically go stir crazy um, and even right. people, you know, I'll have conversations with people who don't ever really think about this sort of stuff, but they'll go, but they'll say, "Oh yeah, I watched sure. Blackfish, and now I get it." So I think documentaries like right. those are just really important and, and definitely big game changers. I haven't right. seen Blackfish. I got to watch that. Well, it's what's crazy about Blackfish is that you know, orcas with like the slumped over dorsal fin that only happens in captivity like they that doesn't happen in the wild that's what blew my mind it's like so we're not only putting them in a captive setting we're now like causing them to become deformed and like and it's just like uh if the animal's coming out deformed maybe we really should just put it back where it came from or just not have it in this setting at all and those scenes, yeah blackfish was yeah, very impactful those scenes in it when um the mother is wailing just crying and crying for its Right. That they've taken away i think that is something that really sticks in your mind right um it's a great right. documentary well we certainly appreciate you guys spending time with us uh yes. i don't know if you're going to work or coming home from work or it's the middle of the day for them <laughs> the day. Taking... Well, so thank you for taking yes thank you so much for taking time out of your okay. day we hope to have you guys on again um I, so we can check out action for dolphins world animal protection again ben from world animal protection uh hannah from Action for Dolphins, sorry, I'm totally just like doubled in my words. Uh, thank you again so much for coming. If we have got any questions, we'll pass them along. Um, again, we really appreciate your time and we hope to have you guys on again. Um, and thank you. Can we, uh, we'll send our listeners to check out both of your websites, correct? Yes. Yes, please. Perfect. Okay. So All Ben, why don't you give your website and then Hannah give yours and then we'll say our final goodbye. Okay, ours is pretty long. It's World Animal Protection. <laughs> that's one word, .org.au for Australia. Perfect. And ours is AFD for actionfordolphins.org.au. Beautiful. Perfect. So you heard it here. That's where you can go check out both their websites. Seem very credible. It's not going to be like a Red Cross thing where you donate your money. It's like, oh, well, we're going to use the money for future problems, not this problem. You know, I'm sure you've her have charities like that in Australia too, where it's like, oh, I thought I was doing something good. And it's like, no, you just kind of throwing money at somebody but you're, yeah you're that's not fantastic. giving money to what you thought you were giving to right you're problem. not giving money to the cause you thought but you were helping we so appreciate and that's kind you of guys what we like fighting to do. the good fight thank you right yeah we appreciate all of your hard work and um i'm sure it's a very thankless job but we're th- we we thank you for doing this yes <laughs> all right. all right thank you for okay. having us. bye-bye now thanks Absolutely. so much for having us on. of course thank, thank you. you so much all thanks right everyone we'll see you guys next week